I didn't have a clue what rugby was <laughs> even when I was 21. So um, I'd never watched the Six Nations, uh, d didn't have a clue about it. So I played netball up until that point. Um, and it was only, I, I finished my degree and stayed on to do a master's. And it was just a friend who I worked with in the Students' Union actually said to me, do you want to give something else a go? Um, so we turned up on Freshers' Fair and signed ourselves up. And basically first um, bit of info I was given by the coaches was run forward, pass backwards. And uh, the, the, I tried to score a try over um, over the try line and slam the ball down like American football. So it was completely <laughs> clueless. Um, but yeah, it, you know, just the the life of uni kind of got me into it. And then I suppose the, the rest of the story is, is from there. Well, I went to school at Barnard Castle um, and started playing rugby at 11, basically, because I was introduced to it. We were all football until we got to the main school. And my recollection of it was literally a classroom, pitch, positions, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I had no idea what rugby was. Um, and when they asked me which position I wanted to um, play, the only one I recognised was a winger because I played on the winger on the on the football team because I was quick. Um, and so that's the position, position I put down. Obviously, the rest is history. Um, so I went through school, and that's that's how I started playing. Just literally at boarding school uh, before joining Middlesbrough um, Rugby Club, 1979. I played in a time when it was um, it was a, an amateur game, so I was doing exactly uh, the same as I always describe to people. You know, I was I played in the World Cup final on a Saturday afternoon at Twickenham, kick off at three o'clock, and then Monday morning eight o'clock I was back at Irish Witten, uh, met brief before going flying again. That was that was the way it was in those. And I described to people as my job was flying jets around um, in the air force, but my hobby was playing rugby. Mm -hmm. And every now and then you played at Twickenham, and that's uh, that's the way it was. So. Um, you know, it wasn't surreal for us, really, because that was that was our life. We, we, you know, that was we understood that when I started playing. Um, and it's uh, it's it's moving a lot, especially in the men's game, massively into the professional era. Um, I think for me, it's given me opportunity to move countries. So I, I, I moved to Ireland and um, meeting people, um, I think the biggest thing about rugby for me is it's a game for all. You meet all types of people um, that you, you may not have become friends with. And I think that's the biggest thing for me, those connections that you make. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's like it's a sport that everyone loves and it, it's a sport for all. Um, and I think that's what's been really important. Um, I agree. Um... Being taken in by Middlesbrough Rugby Club as a young 16 year old, it was very formative in my first five years of playing senior rugby before I joined the Air Force. Um, and I completely agree with Sophie, you know, I've, I've travelled the world, uh, been on tour to some fantastic places. Um, and, you know, I, I know they're talking about it, but for me, two tours with the Lions, that, that's, that's another level again of, um, you know, playing with um, the best of the best from the, from the home unions and going out there and playing against the best countries, playing against Australia and New Zealand. It's, it's one hell of an experience um, and without doubt the highs and lows, I mean, Sophie, I'm sure you'll agree with this, the highs and lows you, you gain, that, that shapes you as a person. You've got to learn and deal mm -hmm. with those sort of ups and downs and uh, definitely that's, uh, that's been very much a part of uh, my learning over the years. Um, I played in the... Um, Pill in the Cup final at Twickenham in 1996, I think it was, and we lost to a penalty try in the last minute against Bath uh, by one point. They got a penalty try and they won in six points in those days. And um, Leon Lloyd and uh, Matt Perry had a testimonial game 11 years later, and they did the grudge match and they had Leicester versus Bath. So they invited all the players from that game to go back and play in a, in a, in a testimonial game. And the Leicester team that day all 15 of us actually turned up to play that day. So I went back to, to, uh, to, to Leicester. I've been retired, um, got it on a year, so, uh, five, seven years. I walked into the, into the change room with my bag over my shoulder. I hadn't done this for like six, seven years. And all the mem memories came back. I walked in the change room and it was like I was teleported 11 years back <laughs> when all 15 of us were looking a little bit podgier and a little bit greyer. <laughs> but the banter around the room was exactly the same as it was 
you know, six, uh, whatever, 11 years ago. And um, I mean, just that, just to go back, you know, because sometimes you can never play replay live. But for that, that small sort of hour or so in the chamber before the game was, uh, was it, again, one of my other highlights. And I said, because of the camaraderie and the crack around the room. I think there's probably two for me, um, and it's kind of two turning points for Irish women's rugby. Um, we won the Grand Slam in 2013, um, so that was massive. We got our final game televised, so it was an absolute dreadful game. Um, it was <laughs> awful weather, kind of hail and terrible pitch, sandy pitch in Milan. Um, and it was a terrible game, but to come away with the Grand Slam, to see all the Irish flags, to see the crowd, and it just, I suppose, again, talking about that exposure for young people to see it at home and the change that it did have for the amount of girls who actually picked up a rugby ball when we came home um, and walking through that airport and just seeing um, students that we would teach and things like that, it was just lovely. Um, and then the other one would be the 2014 World Cup. First time an Irish team beat New Zealand um, and unfortunately we did a job for England and they went and won the World Cup but um, <laughs> you know to to say that we were the first Irish team to to beat New Zealand um, it, it was like it, it was our second game but it was like our final at that point you know um, and we made it to the semi-finals so it was a fantastic tournament. A hundred percent. I mean, I work with students um, on the B Tech, and all they wanted to do was go out, kick a kick a football around, or throw a rugby ball around, and trying to entice them in to get the studies and get them get them complete. You know, um, it was it was hard to balance, to be honest, when I first started teaching because I tried to explain it as well. Sport and careers aren't going to last forever, unfortunately. Um, and you need a backup plan. So what, what other things may interest you, whether it is just sports, solely sport, are you interested in coaching? Um, do you know, is, is, there another, is there another element of sport that we could get you interested in? Um, but I think, yeah, people need to have a backup plan. And if it's through education, um, I think, you know, we need, to, we need to have something else because unfortunately, if it's an injury um, and that's something that's gonna put you out as an elite player, um, and end your career early, you need to have a plan B. Um, so I think education, if you can, I, I know working in Leinster, I think it was um, basically the boys in the academy, I think they all had to be studying some sort um, to be a part of the academy. It was important for them to do that, to, to also have something alongside the rugby as well, um, which I completely agree with. 100%, you know, I've, I've seen many, many um, players along the way retire at the age of 23, 24 because of an injury um, in the professional game and suddenly um, their whole next year, 10 year plan has just been blown out the window. Uh, and that's one of the problems trying to do a 10 year plan when you're a rugby player can is, is fraught with obviously high risk from injury. Um, so I 100% agree, um, as, as Sophie says, with regards to uh, any, any sort of qualification, training, um, school, degree, whatever it is to get something that can help you. Um, the, the, the challenges, as I'm so sure you're dealing with all the students, is when you are 18, 19, 20, 21, you're not thinking about 10, no. 12, 15, 30 years' time. And that's, that is a real challenge. But, you know, it is a duty of care, especially for any professional clubs, to try and engender within uh, all the rugby players to make sure they set themselves ready for Because the last thing we want, you know, you hear it a lot in football, they get to the end of their careers, leave, and then suddenly go, right, uh, I need a job, uh, don't know. And I've heard many, many stories of, um, uh, you know, ex-sports people, a bit of in cricket as well, they get to the end of the career and some people struggle because they haven't got to go to this, so no purpose in their life. Um, and, it's, and it's quite hard to see some, a lot of the um, players nowadays, you see a lot of them setting up their own companies, either CBD, coffee shops, um, clothing brands or whatever. And that's great to see, but not everybody's got that same entrepreneurial spirit and trying to give somebody something that they can walk into is, is I think, is massively important. Mm -hmm.